I've got three laws of influence for you today that I believe apply to every single one of you. I think we're going to see them played out in Scripture today. The first one is this. There are no neutral relationships. There are no neutral relationships. In your life, there's no neutral relationships. In Lot's life, as we're going to see, there are no neutral relationships. There are positive and there are negative relationships, but there are no neutral relationships. So, so, so we see this. When Lot was around Abraham, what happened? He's got blessings overflowing. He's got so much blessing in his life that he doesn't know what to do with it. It's unreal, the blessing that he's seeing. But, 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 as soon as Lot moves, as soon as Lot moves to Sodom, we see the opposite also take place. You see, what, what we'll see further down in, in the story is that Lot actually gets into lots of trouble. And I, I, I would guess that if you looked in your own life, you would see the same thing is true in your relationships. Every single one of your friendships either points you in a positive place or they point you in a negative direction. Now, it might not be instantaneous, but over time, it'll either draw you toward righteousness or draw you away from righteousness. Now, can, you, can I just clue you in on something, Christian? We are naturally drawn to unrighteousness. Yeah, we're, we're saved and we're redeemed and we're made new and God has a new plan and a new purpose for our lives, but he also leaves us in these flesh suits that are drawn away to sin. I love what D.A. Carson, the theologian D.A. Carson, says about the same concept. He says this, he says that apart from grace-driven effort, people do not gravitate toward godliness, prayer, and obedience to Scripture, faith, and delight in the Lord. No, you know where you drift? You don't drift toward Jesus, you drift toward yourself. You have to work at pursuing Christ. And so what we see in the story as you continue reading Genesis chapter 14 is the king of Sodom gets in trouble with some other kings. Some other kings, they team up and they go to war with the king of Sodom. And because of Lot's proximity to Sodom, they go and they attack Sodom, they defeat Sodom, they burn Sodom to the ground, and they take all of these people and livestock and treasure away. And because of Lot's proximity to Sodom, Lot and his wife and his children and all of his treasure goes as well. Lot is a prisoner of war because he's chosen to set up shop next to people that aren't God's people. But you know what happens? You know who comes to his rescue? Good old Uncle Abe. Abraham hears about this, and he's outraged. And even though he's going up against kingdoms, literal kingdoms of people, he looks at his guys, and he sees that he has 318 men, but he also has the mighty God of all armies, and he goes to war against these men, and he swiftly defeats them. And he defeats them, not because he's an amazing warlord. Rather, he defeats them because he serves the Lord of all lords. And God fights on his behalf. And Christian, can I just remind you today, in case you've forgotten, regardless of the scenario you find yourself in, the trouble that you're facing today, if you are pursuing Christ, God is fighting for you. Even when it feels like everything is hopeless, God is fighting for you. And so, so, so he goes and, and he fights and he, he swiftly defeats everything, so much so that Lot makes it back with his wife, with his children, and with all of his possessions. Lot gets it all and Abraham gets the rest. So Lot goes to battle, saves his jerk nephew, and then he comes back with more treasure than he had to begin with. And you would think, you would think that Lot would have learned his lesson. Right? Like, I'm staying as far away from that place as possible. I'm, I'm getting by Uncle Abe. Hey, you can have all my cows and all my sheep and all that stuff. I just want to be near you. I don't want to, I don't want to get taken captive again. That wasn't fun. But what we see is immediately, this time Lot doesn't only move near Sodom. This time he moves within the city walls. Because, again, he was too prideful to see the law of influence on his life. He believed that no one else was influencing him but himself. The second law of influence is 
Who you choose to be around, you will eventually become. Who you choose to be around, you will eventually become. And we all know this, especially those of you that have ever had a teenager. Anybody in here ever had a teenager? I, we used to laugh about this all the time in the student ministry because it was not uncommon. We could always tell when a student in the student ministry had a new friend because everything about them would change. I mean, their hair color, their accent, their wardrobe, their hobbies, everything would change. And then like the next week, it'd all be back the same again. It's the craziest thing. So we, we see this on display, but I also want to say this, even though the change might slow down once you hit 25, this is still true for you today as well, adults. Who you choose to be around, you will eventually become. Lot was blinded by the sin that he was around. So much so that he had his daughters betrothed to two of the men that were trying to take advantage of two visitors that came into the town. So much so that Lot's wife yearned so much for the city that she couldn't even grasp the mercy that God was offering her. Why? Because who you choose to be around, you will eventually become. I wish this story ended well. I wish there was kind of a silver lining and a like happy ending kind of thing. Like, oh man, Lot, Lot figured it out this time, but he didn't. And instead, Lot kind of takes a different turn this next time. And, and the text tells, if you go read it this next week, that Lot, after this, he, he says, you know what? I've been hurt before. I've made bad decisions in this way before. Never again. I'm not going to be in relationship with people. And how many, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I wonder how many in this room have been through the same thing, right? You've experienced pain, difficulty, hurt. Someone has hurt you in relationship. Maybe Christian people have hurt you. You're like, you know what? I'm never doing that again. You know what? I'm, I, no way. I, the only problems I'm going to have are my problems. So I'm not going to have anybody else's problems. I don't care what anybody else thinks about me. And that's Lot's exact thought. Lot thinks that it will be more painful to be around people. And so he's going to be in isolation. He's going to back out. And he does. He moves up to a hill with just his daughters. It's just them three that live on a hillside. But what you see is the greatest depravity that occurs in Lot's life doesn't happen when Lot is in community. It happens when he's alone. The greatest destruction that happens for Lot does not happen when he's surrounded by people. It happens when he pulls himself away from people. And you can go and read the story. It, 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 it tells us that Lot descends into alcoholism, which eventually leads him to have an incestuous relationship with both of his daughters, causing generation and generation of sin and difficulty throughout the remainder of the Old Testament. Christian, I think, I, I think this message is especially pertinent for us in a post-COVID era, but you need people. Christian, you need other Christians. Sometimes we think, especially when we've been hurt, especially when we've been wounded, and, and I'm not asking for your story, but I know, because I know I have, I know you have been hurt in relationships. Even if you're not willing to admit it, even if you're a man in your room like, I don't get hurt, oh, right, that, that kind of thing. Even, even you, you've been wounded in relationships. And, and we think that the remedy to that is isolation. Can I just tell you this? You might get hurt in another relationship, but if you isolate yourself, you will get hurt. See, Lot fell for, again, the third law of influence, and it's this. The third law of influence is that we are never fully formed. We are never fully formed. We think that after we reach a certain age or a certain maturity, that I'm a fully formed adult. I think for myself. I act for myself. And on top of that, I'm a dadgum American, right? Nobody tells me what to do. We think that. And we think that I'm fully formed. And all this other, but, but the truth is, this doesn't happen until you get to heaven. You're not fully formed until Christ reforms you. And, and if you don't know, and I know we started with this earlier, but if you don't know where you're headed, if you don't know how you're being influenced, it's not because you're not being influenced. It's just because you're unaware of it. It's just because you're not in control of the direction. I know I'm a little bit over, but I want to end with a story um, 
Many of you know my wife and I lived several years overseas. And uh, when we lived overseas, uh, we, we lived in a different culture. Everything was different. Language, culture, uh, even kind of social interactions, food, uh, driving styles, everything. Uh, everything you can imagine was remarkably different than what we had experienced in America. And after we lived there for a little while, uh, we went through this thing where we experienced uh, what's called culture shock. Uh, and if you've never lived overseas, it might not be something that you've ever dealt with. Though if you've ever left Texas, maybe you have, I don't know. Uh, but but it, it's something that you deal with when you move overseas, when, when you're immersed in a culture and you experience all these things and everything is different all the time and you just want your culture. And it almost develops uh, just an anger in your heart for your host culture, where you are. Kind of an anger in your, where you're like, I don't want to see that again. I don't want to taste that. Like for me, let me tell you, all I wanted was a plate of Tex-Mex, an ice cold Dr. Pepper. I wanted to shoot guns and grill a ribeye steak. That's what I wanted. <laughs> and and I, I recognize I'm texting through and through, but that, that's what I wanted. And I, I, just, I just remember being so frustrated over there. And, and getting sick and, and, and us kind of being, we didn't even know we weren't in a great place. And I remember we had a supervisor who was really kind of like a pastor. I mean, other than my dad, he's probably taught me more about pastoring people than anyone else. And I remember he, he had us, we, he was talking to us one day and he said, hey, if you're not going through it yet, you're eventually gonna go through culture shock. He said, the answer to culture shock is not isolating yourself in your apartment. And can I tell you, that's what we were doing. Like taco night, watch a movie, binge Netflix, you know, do that whole thing. He said, the answer to it is not that. Instead, when you start feeling that, the way that you are healed from culture change is by immersing yourself more in the culture. And I remember thinking, you are an absolute idiot. <laughs> what are you talking about? have you ever gone through this? Like, what do you mean? But, but we, he, had, he had been uh, there longer than we, way, way, way longer than we had. And we weren't perfect, but we just trusted him. And we're like, you know what we're going to do this? We're going to get out. And you know what we learned? <laughs> we learned that he was right. But we learned that, man, the people were beautiful. We learned that, man, that culture was amazing. We learned that, man, this food is incredible. We learned that, you know what, there is no perfect culture, even though I believe that Texas culture is the closest to heaven. I believe that. But there, there is no perfect culture. And we, we learned that all people are people that need to know Jesus. Jesus.